Karen T. Yamashita is one of the most inventive and unpredictable writers whose work I've had the pleasure of reading. And it's a real honor to have this opportunity to say a few words about an international writer, an American writer, and not least of all, an Asian American and Japanese American writer. I mention all these adjectives because her books span all of them and travel across many borders while always putting at their center the stories of diverse peoples in the Americas, including those of Asian descent. Karen Zuv has been enormously meaningful to me, someone who was saved by discovering Asian American literature in the same year Karen began publishing. This was 1990. I was a college student wondering if a Vietnamese refugee like me could be a writer in English, whether someone like me could be a part of America. Along comes Karen with her first novel, Through the Arc of the Rainforest, which promptly blows my mind. We are a part of America, yes, the novel says. But by America, Karen meant more than just the United States. Through the Arc of the Rainforest brings together magical realism and the telenovela in a story about environmental destruction, a Japanese migrant to Brazil, and a wide cast of characters whose stories allow Karen to begin exploring themes she would pursue for the next 30 years. The movements of migrants, the depredations of capitalism, the fraught difficulties of race relations, and the challenges of writing about history and memory from South to North America, from Japan to the United States. Her next novel, Brazil Maru, about Japanese emigration to Brazil, was prescient in foregrounding the Japanese in Latin America when much more attention was being paid to Japanese Americans in the United States. Karen's work implies that this kind of U.S. focus blinds us in the United States, not only to much of the rest of the world, but also to how we are impacted by global forces of war, migration, and capitalism that we help instigate. Her third and landmark novel, Tropic of Orange, on which countless dissertation chapters have been written, imagines Los Angeles as a site of an apocalyptic, but still funny, moment of convergence caused by a gigantic orange moving from Mexico to California and bringing with it the Tropic of Cancer. You gotta read it to see how many threads Karen weaves together. She's ambitious, and it's one of the things I most love and admire about her as a writer. She can move easily from a grand project like Tropic of Orange to Circle K Cycles, a book of short pieces about Japanese Brazilians who go to Japan for low-wage work, or Sansei and Sensibility, another book of short pieces inspired by Jane Austen featuring Japanese Americans. Her work, as serious as it is about the damage we do to each other and to the world, is also streaked with humor and satire as well as ultimately a deep humanity and compassion. This is one reason why I found her letters to memory so moving, a work inspired by the collective Yamashita family archive, which spans the 20th century and all of the human drama found in an extensive family, including the internment of Japanese Americans. Internment was not only a Japanese American event, it was an American event, an American tragedy. And Karen's work won't allow us to forget that history. That's one reason why her masterpiece, The Eye Hotel, is for me the great Asian American novel, with Asian in parentheses. It is the great American novel with Asians and Asian Americans and their histories, literatures, battles, politics, and jokes at the heart of it. What's also at the heart of The Eye Hotel is radical hope, a conviction found in all of Karen's work that we can and must fight for a more just future, and that literature the imagination, and the writer all have important roles to play. She has played her role with an unwavering commitment to her artistic vision, giving us an indisputably distinguished contribution to American letters. Karen, congratulations on this richly deserved medal. To the Board of Directors of the National Book Foundation, Chair David Steinberger, Executive Director Ruth Dickey, and Associate Director Anna Dobbin. Thank you for this gracious and profound honor. And thank you, Viet Wind, for your gracious introduction. I have perused the names of former honorees, including the illustrious Maxine Hong Kingston, and I'm stunned to be here. Yet I know I'm here because of a small but mighty independent press Coffeehouse Press, and its visionary publisher, Alan Kornblum. Read my work and took a chance on my writing. Alan and the Coffeehouse 
staff schooled me in the world of publishing, that mix of business acumen, intellectual and social influence, the art of bookmaking, and the love of language and story. After launching my first novel, Alan asked, well, Karen, what do you got next? Oh, I answered, very different, you won't want it, to which he said, let us be the judge of that. Since then, I've published all my books with Coffee House. Over the years, they've kept my books in print. Thus, readers continue to have access to my books. I'm here because Coffee House has envisioned the long distance of a writer's journey, knowing that books take time to be read and to be shared. Coffee House has understood that a small margin of profit over time might give authors like me a chance to grow and to find a readership. I have grown up as a writer within an Asian American literary community. Ah, but where is Asian America? It is, I believe, an imagined space that recognizes the immigration and participation of Asian and Pacific Islander peoples in American society and political life. Initially, this literature asserted its grounding within American continental history, but it has always been referential to the crossing of oceans. This navigation has not necessarily been Pacific, but the result of colonialism, racism, and war. Asian American literature is at heart a literature of politics and resistance. For our community, your recognition tonight is significant, especially this year, post-pandemic, having weathered the Twitter of absurdity, corruption, and mendacity, the brutality of racial profiling, and the provocation of anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, anti-Muslim, anti-Asian hatred. In such times, may our writing forge tolerance and care. I am also here because of the generosity and support of a broader shared community, caring mentors and teachers across the world, and most significantly colleagues, students, and staff at the University of California at Santa Cruz, who've provided me with a home to research and to write. And I'm here because my friends and family, close and extended, especially my stalwart sister, Jane Tomey, and my creative husband and partner, Ronaldo, have given me love and faith because you've believed. Many years ago, my aunts, Chizu and Kay, took me to visit the author, Yoshiko Uchida. Years later, I would discover in Aunt Kay's cache of letters, her wartime correspondence with her dear friend, Kay Uchida, Yoshiko's sister. I took for granted the connection of the Yamashita family to the Uchida's connections through the church and UC Berkeley and to their wartime incarceration at Topaz in Utah. I know that Chiz and Kay planned this meeting with Yoshiko Uchida because they were proud aunties who thought I was a writer. This memory is both comical and sweet to me. And meanwhile, Yoshiko Uchida, who met an earnest Sansei kid in college, had no idea. In those years, Uchida was the most successfully published Japanese-American writer of her generation. I may name other Nisei writers, Toshio Mori, John Okada, Jean Wakatsugi Houston, Mitsue Yamada, Hisai Yamamoto, Wakako Yamauchi. Of these writers, only Uchida was able to live by her craft. Not that she was swimming in royalties, she lived alone and very modestly. In 1949, Uchida published her first book, The Dancing Tea Kettle and Other Japanese Folk Tales. I assume this book, read to me as a child, to have been the first book of Japanese folk tales written in English. Of these tales, one story that continues to resonate for me is Urashima Taro. In the story, Taro saves a giant turtle from bullying children, returning it to the sea. One day while Taro is fishing, the turtle reappears and in thanks 
invites Taro to visit the princess of the sea. Taro climbs onto the turtle's back and travels to the bottom of the ocean. He lives there in luxury, but at last he misses home. As he leaves, the princess offers him a small jewel box warning that if he wishes to return, he must never open that box. Well, perhaps you know this story. The turtle may be a magical but inscrutable being upon whose back we climb to find our destiny. Perhaps what lies ahead is an adventure or an escape or the moment of our death. The turtle is a great vehicle, a silent spaceship. The responsibility of our journey is only our own. Or the turtle with its shell as home has a different lesson, how we must travel within our bodies, even if marked by ethnicity, gender, color. Immigrants, refugees, exiles, by the fortunes of life, have set forth on the backs of immortal turtles to distant places, sometimes alternate, displaced, bombed out realities to discover that return is impossible. There is also the predicament of our mobility as globalized transnationals, often celebrated, but for many migrant laborers, a state in limbo and of great precarity. I have also pondered the meaning of the jewel box, its secret hidden within, the dream, the soul, the joyful, horrific, messy contradictions of life, the story of a journey, indeed, the book. Writers have remembered or imagined these journeys, sometimes revealed intensely, extravagantly, comically, or insanely violent. But the imagination is the only sane site where we can play, make satire and farce, do bloody combat, express grief and anger, find solace, reconciliation. Urashima Taro, his heart filled with confusion, curiosity, wonder, seeking answers, will open his gifted box and reap the consequences. We discover that writing what we think, churning ideas on the page, can reconstruct ways of thinking. Ideas are dangerous and transformative. Writing them is creative work for which we are responsible, accountable. Writing requires our constant care and integrity. I thank all of you who have gifted me with this amazing journey. I have been truly blessed. Thank you.